Welcome. It is I, your ghost host, Mr. Oliver. And today is a mini lecture about Russia. Okay, so Russia had been under the controls of the Mongols since the 13th century. Mr. Oliver, ain't that sort of before 1450? Because ain't that when the class starts, so ain't it improper for it to be in the 13th century? Well, you know, McKay talks about this, and I, I really believe that McKay is talking about this more as kind of a bridge to make it make sense, um, like where we're at, because he kind of just glosses over it. He says, look, uh, Genghis Khan and the Golden Horde and all those guys, they conquered Russia. Uh, he doesn't really go into the whole Boris and Gleb thing, if you know about that. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, and long story short, Russia is under the control of the Mongols. Done. Do we need to know about the Mongols? All I need to know about the Mongols is Russia was under the control of them. Eventually, the Prince of Moscow, uh, symbols of coalition, defeats them and adopts the title of Tsar of Russia. Mr. Oliver? Oh, yes, a different British student, yes. Czar spelled differently in the book. Yeah, um, the word czar is um, kind of an, an interesting one because you've got here, this is the old spelling of it. And I kind of like using that for this lecture just because it helps me remember that czar, it's hard to write and draw, it looks a lot like the word Caesar. Um, because that is actually what it is. They are adopting the title of Caesar. They are saying, hey, we are continuing the Roman Empire. But aren't they Russian? Yeah, yeah, they're Russian. But they see themselves as this great Christian nation, the continuation of the Roman Empire, and later yet, the continuation of the Byzantine Empire. So if you don't know about that, don't, don't worry about it. It's not really relevant except just they call themselves Caesar. And if you're like, I, w I wish to warn no more about this. Okay, then actually research that. But otherwise, don't worry about it. Anyway, um, Russia uses the Cyrillic alphabet. They use a different alphabet. So here is the Cyrillic alphabet here. Um, but you notice that theirs are different. They have different letters. Like there are some things that we don't have at all in the English language. So when you're trying to translate a word from the Cyrillic to English, it can be difficult. So uh, what they did originally was they translated uh, czar with a C-Z-A-R. But nowadays, most historians think T-S-A-R is a better approximation of the way it was in the original language. Um, I don't know if I said historian, linguist, most linguists. Uh, think that. Um, it has to do really with trying to respect the original culture and stuff like that. All you really need to know, those are equal. Those are the same word, two different spellings. Pick one and stick with it. If I'm you and I don't yet have a preference, I might stick with the more accepted modern version of T-S-A-R. If you're a 60-year-old professor, you might like the old one. Whatever. Uh, after we've got a leader who is situated in Moscow, or as, as McKay is very fond of just saying, the Muscovite princes. All that means is they're from Moscow. Okay, just, just chill out, McKay. Uh, anyway, you get the first really interesting one, in my opinion, is Ivan the Terrible. And he is kind of an absolutist in that he reinforces the power of the Tsar over his nobles, which, again, you notice that nobles aren't called nobles. Uh, they have a special name for them in Russia, and that is the boyars. That was supposed to be the word noble. That did not work. I forgot to put the N in noble, so that would be obols. And he does this by basically being terrifying. Like, literally, when he first takes over, he has uh, one noble dude, like, torn apart by dogs uh, just to make a point to the other nobles, like, hey, guys, I'm in charge. Don't mess with me. He even abdicates the throne temporarily and is begged to come back 
and then once he's begged to come back, he eliminates hundreds of enemies in this bloody, I'm going to get rid of all my traitors ceremony um, against the walls of the Kremlin. This guy is hardcore. Uh, the famous story is that the architect who had this uh, cathedral built, it's such a beautiful thing. And Ivan the Terrible says, yo, he, pro he probably didn't actually say yo. He was probably like, so anyway, um, Ivan the Terrible said, hey, do you think you could ever make something like so beautiful like this again? And the guy was like, well, sure, I I'm sure I could. And so Ivan had his his eyes poked out so he could never, ever make such a beautiful building again. That's the kind of person we're dealing with. Anyway, Ivan, surprisingly, is not a good father, uh, accidentally kills his son. You know how it is, as one does. They, they accidentally kill their son. Uh, see, he had uh, gotten to a squabble with his son's pregnant wife and knocked her down, uh, causing her, I believe, to lose the baby. And uh, his son got angry, and they tousled, and he ended up accidentally killing his son. So after he dies, there's no heir. And um, how can I breathe with no air? No, no, not like that. Not like that kind of air. Um, I'm talking about air as far as H E I R. So nobody took nobody took over because the son's dead. So there's there's all kinds of chaos in Russia because Ivan, for all his terribleness, and I mean that both in the imposingness and in the uh, he was really truly an awful human being. Uh, it creates all kinds of problems. Eventually, a compromise is reached, and they turn to Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the Terrible's grandnephew, whose name is Mikhail or Michael in our language, uh, Romanov. The Romanov dynasty is a good one to know because they will be in charge for the next 300 years. Uh, he takes over in uh, 1613. He will last until uh, no. Uh, he'll till last until 1917, so a little over 300 years, really. And the last one will be Nicholas II. You might be familiar with him because he has some pop culture renown. They've actually done books and movies and stuff about him. Poor Michael, not so much. Whoa, Mr. Oliver, big old jump in time. 1613, 1682. Here's the thing. we got to hit the highlights here. So, 1682, we got Peter the Great. And Peter the Great, Peter the First of Russia, is a young man who is fascinated with ships. Problem. Russia does not have a warm water port. Uh, in the east, they're so far located north that stuff freezes over. So they're like, we need to do something about that. So he decides, you know what? I admire these Europeans. And frankly, this is a constant thing with Russia. They always are, they always have this insecurity thing as far as Russia goes in relation to the West. It's like, are we going to be an Asian country or are we going to be a Western country? If we're going to be a Western country, we need to be able to keep up with the Frances and the Austrias and the Britons of the world. If we're going to be an Asian country, what's our role in the world? Are we going to isolate ourselves like the Chinese did at this time period or are we going to try to interact? And Peter's like, no, no, I am firmly on the we are European country bandwagon. So he goes to Europe. Um, I've heard different stories here that he goes in disguise, despite the fact that he is a large man. I mean, we're talking that he's six foot eight. That would be large in 2015. This is in the 1600s. He is a giant of a man. Anyway, he had an entourage. He was traveling with people. He also had a pet monkey. That's true. Uh, he had a pet monkey. Unfortunately, the pet monkey ended up dying um, on this journey, which is very sad. Um, would be a good buddy comedy um, slash adventure coming of age tale, kind of like the life of Pi, only with a pet monkey. Anyway, um, Peter the Great travels over, um, probably not very in disguise given the fact that he's giant and the fact he's traveling with a bunch of Russian people and he doesn't speak very much um, of the European languages that he's going to in the different countries. But he starts learning shipbuilding methods. He wants to be like a man of the people. Now imagine kings are not very hands-on for the most part. Like Louis the Fourteenth and his ilk, they think they know everything perhaps, but they're really not going to get their hands dirty too much. It's beneath them. Peter the Great is kind of do this like, 
hey, you know what I know how to do? Build a ship. He's like a soldier dude. And he is very, very comfortable with his men. Uh, he goes back to Russia. He says, look, guys, we need to be more like the Europeans. And a lot of the old... Sorry, I discovered a secret. Anyway, um, so he goes back to Russia, and he's like, "Yeah, guys, we gotta, we gotta do, we gotta upgrade." And they're all like, "Peter the Great, what are you saying? Uh, we are, we are very old-fashioned. We do things our way. We don't want to be European." And he's like, "Yo, um, you know what they don't do in Europe is grow out their beards." And the nobles are like, "We totally grow out our beards. That's a sign of manliness." He's like, "Nope. By order of the Tsar, everyone has to." cut their beards. Oh. Hey, you know over in the West, and they're like, oh god, what else? And he's like, uh, yeah, um, nobles have to be in service to the military. And they're like, oh, okay. In fact, uh, you have to do that. In fact, also, you should send your children over to the West to get a good education. Wow, lots of things, lots of big changes. But the thing that really makes the biggest difference is that he starts really pushing increased shipbuilding and Western shipbuilding tactics. And this means bringing over Western advisors. And as he does so, he begins to really start implementing a lot of Western style uh, ways of doing things. But the big test is when he goes to war with a Western country. Now in this case, it is Sweden. Oftentimes in America, we don't really think of the Swedes as being a like you know, hey, okay, they got some awesome, like, black metal, but other than their heavy metal products, what are they really famous for? Like, fish? Uh, well, there was a time, and this is it, where they had an absolute ruler, and they were something to be reckoned with. The reason that we don't think of them as being that powerful today is because they lose this war on this slide here, the Great Northern War. Uh, basically, Peter the Great says, look, I want a uh, war with you, and the stuff in the greenish kind of aqua, well, not really aqua, I guess it's what chartreuse, I don't, I don't know words, um, he wants to take over from Sweden. Sweden goes to war. They school them at first, and that is the Swedes school the Russians. At the, um, at the Battle of Narva, uh, the Swedes totally defeat uh, Peter, but Peter is a, a super optimistic guy, and he's like, look, what we need here is we just simply need to readjust the way we think about things, bring in Western advisors, make our military more Russian, not, sorry, less Russian, more European in order to fight our European foes. And sure enough, war is a great teacher for him. By 1721, Russia defeats Sweden at the Battle of Poltava. Um, actually, Potava takes place before, but that's like after that, the Swedes are no longer in, on the offense. And um, they managed to win a warm water port. Then Peter says, you know what we need to do? Build a new capital here. And everyone's like, it's a swamp. He's like, yeah, we're going to build it. And it's a Baroque style capital. He's basically trying to do his European city. He says, Moscow, too old school, too remote. Here's St. Petersburg, it's accessible. I can go visit other people in other countries and they can come visit me. It's my window to the West, is what he calls it. So he's, um, he's all like, oh, hey, we're gonna have this built. But it's a swamp. So when people are trying to build it, they're getting diseases, there's all kinds of issues. But he just perseveres. And uh, St. Petersburg claims the lives of thousands of workers and yet, he still manages to persevere, boom, makes a new capital, and that is St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is really pretty. I've never gone there, I really want to. So here's some pictures of St. Petersburg being pretty. Meanwhile, a new challenger appeared, and it is Prussia. And you're all like, um, did you misspell Russia because you were just talking about Russia? Nope, the P is for Prussia. Where is Prussia? Well, let me tell you. Here, I found a nice little map for you. Uh, Prussia, assuming that this is Northern Europe and this is like modern day Poland here. Let's see, Prussia is this stuff in red. So if you look, what's their major cities here? Berlin, Potsdam is a major one, Konigsberg, King's Castle, King's Fortress, 
Wait a second, Mr. Oliver, this is Central Europe, isn't it? And I'm all like, mm-hmm. And the capital is Berlin? And I'm like, mm-hmm. So what is Prussia going to evolve into? It's going to become Germany. Not for another 170 years or so, but it's going to eventually become Germany. And think of this as it's like a pre-evolution. And then it keeps taking over things, getting a little bigger, and its final form is early 20th century Germany. That we, so now that we got that, uh, we got Prussia, and we're just going to call it Prussia because that's what it is, and the dynasty there is the Hohenzollern, which I enjoy pronouncing Hohenzollern because it sounds like they're from like the east coast of Canada or something, but my wife, who is German, my wife, uh, she does not like that. So uh, she, it's Hohenzollern. Okay, whatever. Anyway, the guy that really does this is Frederick William the Great Elector. And if you're all like, wait a second, um, Frederick William, that's a little confusing. There's a lot of first names there. Yeah, you don't even know, brothers and sisters. Uh, because Frederick William, are, those two names are like the most popular names for Prussian kings, and they use just combinations of them. And to make it more complicated, this first dude... Not a king. He's an elector. Now, here's uh, boring but important. It used to be when the Holy Roman Empire was doing its thing, there were princes in Germany, right? Okay. Well, some of the princes were more important than other ones. They were called electors. And the electors elected the Holy Roman Emperor, like your Ferdinands and your Ferdinand II's and such. It was largely symbolic. They elected them the same way that the Electoral College elects the president uh, here in America, in that it's, you know, you pretty much know how it's going to go ahead of time. But uh, Frederick William, the great elector, seizes on the weakness of the Holy Roman Empire after the Thirty Years' War and starts grabbing up power for himself. And he does not become a king. It is not really until his grandson. Now, pause. If you really know about this, you're going to be like, um, what about Frederick III, who was also an elector? Sorry, I found another treasure. So yeah, th th there is another elector, and then he technically becomes the first king. So he becomes King Frederick I. Uh, his nickname is Frederick the Ostentatious. Frankly, for a survey course, I don't think you're very likely to encounter any questions about Frederick I the Ostentatious. The first really significant king of Prussia is Frederick William I, named in honor of Frederick William the Great Elector. This is confusing because they have the same name, but only one of them has a Roman numeral. That's because this guy wasn't a king, this guy is. Got it? Okay. This guy, uh, Frederick William I, is known as the Soldier King, and he makes Prussia into the Sparta of the North. And you might be like, I know about Sparta. Yeah, this is the popular image of Sparta, but what do you think of when you think of Sparta like, um, you know, like the 300 movie? You think of this incredibly competent, warlike society, right? The analogy holds up, because Frederick is incredibly warlike hello uh, Frederick William is the first is incredibly warlike he makes basically the army to be the fourth largest in Europe think back to that little map I showed you how small they were having the fourth largest army in Europe with a tiny little country like they have is very impressive because that's you know in relation to your France's and your Austria's and your Russia's um, that's pretty good, having that large an army. What's more, and this is a little cheat sheet here, when you think of Prussia, think of Great Army. Just like when you think of Britain, you think of Great Navy. Prussia, Great Army. Prussia is not going to lose very much as far as wars and such go. They are pretty dope. They're spending 80% of their taxes on the army. Very significant. Uh, they create a, I say here, a cult of militarism. The officers are in the army are the highest social class. They get special privileges. If you're just a, a do-nothing noble, nah. Nah, doesn't work. 
But here's the deal. He makes this amazing army, arguably pound for pound the best army in Europe. And then doesn't use them. Just doesn't use them very much. He uses it to police his kingdom. He doesn't want to hurt them. He's very fond of large soldiers, like tall soldiers, and he doesn't want any of them to be injured. It's like he created this toy box, filled it up with soldier toys, and then he's like, well, I don't want to ruin my, you know, their mint condition. I don't want to mess with them. I mean, literally, moms were telling their kids, like, stop eating because you're going to grow up big and tall and Frederick William is going to put you in his army. Okay, it was, it was a, it was a thing. All right, let's move over to Austria. After the Thirty Years' War, as we've seen, controlling what used to be the Holy Roman Empire was pretty impossible for the Austrians. So they start looking like, okay, what can we do? How do we remain relevant? Well, for one, we look inward. Let's make sure everybody speaks German. So here's your what used to be all under their control in the middle of Europe is nearly no longer. So they say, look, what can we do? Um, for one, Bohemia, those guys were acting up. So we need to get those guys on, on fleck, okay, under control. So um, we are going to enforce, enforce, enforce German speakingness there. Um, also, all the rest of it. What else can we do? Hey, what's that? Hungary. I suppose I am Hungary for conquest of Hungary. Yeah, that's right. They go and take that over. Why didn't they do that before? Because that it belonged to the Ottoman Empire, a country empire that really hasn't shown up in this class very much so far, except in illusions. Um, I don't mean like illusions, like woo. I mean like an illusion with an A. Like uh, McKay just briefly mentions them. In other words, anyway, so. It's the other one. It's not the other one. Okay. So they say, hey, we should go attack stuff around there and, uh, and try to uh, snatch that away from the Ottoman Empire. And they're very successful, actually, because the Ottoman Empire is in decline and will continue to be in decline until about January or February of this course, where they finally cease to exist. Uh, also, they say, hey, nobles. We want you to be loyal. We want you to be on the same page as us. And the nobles are all like, you know, what will you do? They're not Russian. I don't know. Well, but let's pretend they are. I mean, they're Austrian Russian. They're like, what? What? Uh, why do we need to be good to you? Huh? Um, what's going on here? And the Austrians are like, hmm, what if you are judge, jury, and ex executioner in regard to your serfs? And they're like, deal. So... They gave more control over their serfs. Uh, well, another war takes place during this time period, and this is the War of the Austrian Succession. See, one of the things with the Austrians is they wanted to keep all their land together. They were very concerned that they were going to start falling apart even further. So they passed this thing called the Pragmatic Sanction, and they say, even if a woman takes over, all the land stays in Habsburg hands. And, sure enough, when the empire passes to Maria Theresa, the Prussians are all sexist and they attack. And I would love to say that they lost. I would love to have it be like some kind of thing where it's like, you know what, and sexism was defeated on this day, and they knew not to mess with her because she's a bad person, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, like, you know, bad astronaut. But that's not at all what happens. She loses, and they lose the territory of Silesia, which actually makes Prussia bigger and stronger. I put this on here if you want to kind of compare uh, what's what and who's what. Um, this actually was part of the original PowerPoint by Susan Pocher. Um, but to kind of see like what's going on at the same time as what. This might be helpful with the periodization that is so important on the new test to kind of know like, oh, who's in power around the same time as who else, that sort of thing. Um, so my, what I might do is um, maybe screenshot this and save it or something. I don't know what you're going to do. Okay, so that's the this uh, interim, this Eastern Absolutism year, uh, unit uh, lecture here. 
Then we're going to go now over to England. That takes a very different path that actually ends up being a constitutional, uh, one where it's less absolutist. After briefly flirting with it, very fascinating. Think you're going to like it. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.